here today with Thomas Gonch. And uh, glad you're here. Uh, this is going to kick off the new Live With series for Studio HFL. We've already got, uh, of course, Thomas is here today. I've got Rex Richardson coming in February. Um, the Rom Family Trio in March. Sergei Nikoryakov in April. Wayne Bergeron in May, and I'm still working. So mm -hmm. this is this is this is a great start. Oh, thanks for the invitation. I'm in good company. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. you know. It, if people don't know who you are, they're probably living under a rock somewhere. <laughs> um, uh, well, most people don't know me, but if they play the trumpet, they might know me. That's well, uh, okay. So that's who matters, right? All the trumpet players should know <laughs> yeah. should know who you are. <laughs> and and I would imagine a lot of people are like me, and in, in that the first introduction to you was through Minosal Brass. And I've I've been corrected several times on how to pronounce that. What, so from the source, uh, it's a, it's a long story cut short. It, it's a Czech name. The original Czech name it's pronounced Nojil, but uh, the forefathers of Nojil they went to Austria. They came to Vienna, and it got like Viennese, and now it's called Nozil here. Uh, but the, the Americans say nozzle, and the 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 <laughs> English the English say manozel brass, and uh, yeah, there are different pronunciations everywhere. But it, it's it's just fine. Well, uh, actually, one of the people that corrected me was uh, a former teacher of yours. I interviewed Carol Dawn Reinhardt last year, ah. and uh, she said you would be surprised at three of my students, my former students. And she said, there's Thomas, oh, yeah. um, uh, of course, Leonard Powell, and yes. uh, was it Wil Wilfred? Wil uh, yeah, Wilfred. Thank you, sorry. Brand Brandstetter, very nice name for, to pronounce. It's uh, <laughs> Brandstetter. <laughs> Brandstetter. Um, but she said, uh, you guys were ideal students, perfect, from top to bottom. Ah. No, I think I think history has blurred her memory. <laughs> no, she she true. actually she actually said uh, uh, well, not the, quite the opposite, but uh, but uh, well, okay. So she was the first one to correct me. She says no zeal brass, and it looks like uh, I'm looking at the comments really quick. It looks like we've got some spam people jumping in here. So I got to figure out how to how to change that later on. But uh, so where did you study with her? For those that hadn't heard that interview with Carol Dawn. Uh, actually, on the Vienna Music University, there were three uh, trumpet seats for the classical trumpet. And she was one of them, but I never actually studied with her in, in the trumpet class. But I should have. Uh, when I think back now, because uh, so Carolyn and myself, we got really to know each other well, uh, four years ago, and uh, I, I I asked myself that question right right that moment. Why didn't I study with Carol? It would have been so much nicer and easier than with the two teachers I studied with. But I had her uh, in a in like a side study. She was conducting a, a an orchestra, mm -hmm. and I, I played there with, uh, with her. But now, since I decided she would have been the perfect teacher for me. I decided to tell people whenever they ask me, yes, I studied with Carol Dawn Reinhardt. <laughs> and everything I know, I know from her. Yeah. Well, she's a lovely person, you know, oh, yeah. and, and uh, she was a, a treat to get to interview. And um, she's, she's a bad player. She, she played live on, on, on Johnny Carson, right? I asked Doc if he remembers her, and he was like, oh, yeah, she can play. Wow. Yeah. So, she is a, a, a real big player. Sorry, I have to close. No, no, that's okay. Because, uh, you know, I'm trying to, we, we try to bring the kids to bed. And unlike in American movies, when you bring kids to bed, they say, good night, daddy. I love you. And then they sleep. And the reality is completely different. So, <laughs> so how many kids have you got? I've got four kids. And, uh, uh, but I have a son. He's not living here. He lives in another part of the country and three daughters and they're going to sleep right now 
Oh my goodness, three daughters. I don't know how. I, I have three boys, but I don't know how anybody with girls. It is, does it. it is heaven and hell. <laughs> um, you mentioned Doc, and right before we came on live, you were asking me about Doc. Uh, I talked to him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, yeah. Yes, he's 93, and he was telling me he's just now starting a new routine. He's starting the yeah. Tebow routine <laughs> at 93. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's inspiration. Every every time you you look at the guy, it's yeah. something he he just doesn't stop. But uh, so uh, I know we're kind of hopping around here at the beginning of this. But uh, okay, back to kind of how you became known really to uh, the masses, as it were, was through all the Nozil brass videos. Oh yeah. And you know, from those early small stages, of course. Well, you still perform on a lot of uh, small and intimate stages uh, uh, at the moment. <laughs> well, yes, especially uh, at the moment. We would be very happy to perform on any stage, but we can't. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we we are a band. We we learned how to entertain the crowd in pubs because Nautil was originally a pub, and mm -hmm. we used to play there once a month. And the the better we would entertain the people the more drinks we would get and this is basically the same business model it has been the same model uh, till today just the drinks changed into dough and we played uh, not in pubs anymore but in, in on stages bigger and bigger um, but we always try to do the same like entertain the, the crowd put, put on a, a really good show because mm -hmm. we didn't like the kind of stiff classical routine you know, wear, wear a tuxedo and play a tune and then make a funny announcement and then play the next tune and everything is like a little uptight. And, and we, we, we brought some great balls of fire. <laughs> well, you know, I love the variety. And of course, Empire Brass, they did what they did oh. extremely well. Canadian Brass does what they do extremely well. Mm -hmm. uh, Boston Brass, right? All of these groups. But I think what you guys have done is exactly what you're talking about. You've taken this beyond the the brass performance. This is truly entertainment, and and, oh, yeah. and, and yeah. without sacrificing any musicality at all. Yeah, that's the trick. Because if if you if you suck at playing, <laughs> uh, the entertainment is not that interesting anymore. It has to sound good. That's the the thing. And uh, and we thought because. The, 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 up to this point, there were only the, the British kind of brass bands and like the Philip Jones mm -hmm. thing was the highest point. And then there was Canadian brass. Uh, they developed a new thing with the quintet. And there were just so many quintets, like like the, you said, the Empire Brass, the Boston Brass, or like here, over here, it was like the Out of Brass Vienna and uh, groups like that. They, they already had taken out the max of this type of performing mm -hmm. and we thought of it in a very different uh, way like like i said it was in pubs we we never played a we never went to play a job uh just for the money we always wanted to own the crowd this was very very important to us so it didn't, yeah. it didn't matter if we played a, a wedding or a funeral or something else we we, we just had to own some of the crowd well, and, 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 yeah, so playing in these pubs, right, playing for people who are maybe not paying attention, right? But you see these videos of you guys sitting around maybe the, the top of the, the pub uh, on the ledge, uh, mm -hmm. but it's still entertainment. Even, I mean, you're, you're providing, uh, even though you're not the show, right? People are coming to eat and drink. Mm. And but you're still entertaining in the background. Can you remember the very first time? Like, how old were you the first time you got to play in a pub, and experience that yourself? With Nautil, I was no you uh, just just you. Uh, it's hard hard. I was probably a baby because my my father was like the the uh, the conductor of the local umpa band, and he he like. He went to the pub like three times a day, and he he took me with him all the time. So I mm -hmm. more or less grew up in pubs. I just I just remember always looking up to my dad at the bar and said, uh, "Are we going to go home soon?" He said, "Yes, I'll just drink up." <laughs> and we had that conversations for hours every day, I guess. And so he he was at that one pub. He he built a stage there where uh, he 
he performed in the during the summer months like every every Sunday with his brass band and I even have photos when I'm conducting this brass band when I'm like a, a baby a, a toddler just standing up for the first time uh, and I don't really remember when I played for the first time but I've, I've been around in around pubs all my life mm -hmm. I, I think this this pandemic is like the longest period of time I, I haven't been to a pub well, let's hope that ends soon. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. not. It's not that bad. I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm. It's. It. I can see it from the healthy side. It. It yeah. helps. <laughs> well, it, so you're doing some really cool things, though. Uh, to well, not just pass the time, but to stay creative and stay uh, on your instrument. And your Gonch at Home series mm -hmm. has been terrific. I've tuned in uh, live, and then I've tuned in after the fact to those and. Uh, is relaxed, is it fun to put that on? I mean, I know it's a different type of performance, a different type of showcase. Is that still it is fun, fun to it, do? It, it is fun to put it on. It was fun in the beginning, uh, very much fun, but always when it ended, uh, you just play in your room for like cameras and then there's nothing, there's no response. And after it ended, I always fell into a deep hole and I was kind of depressive. So, uh, I had to learn to deal with that. And most of the shows were really airing live. Uh, we only recorded, we pre-recorded three um, for different reasons. We are going to record one two days from now because now with the pandemic, it's not possible to, to play live at the same time with the same musicians from different countries. It gets, it's getting complicated. Uh, but we we only there was only one one thing we pre-recorded and one of the guys who played with me was not happy with a tune so we had to re-record one tune uh, after the show and then we uh, cut it in because mm -hmm. he liked the version more and this is the only thing that I was really not happy with because it was not organic it didn't it didn't yeah. feel real and it wasn't a real thing and interestingly. Uh, People love to be there, tune in live, and be there for the live experience. This is what it makes special. Of course, you can always rewatch it and, and watch it afterwards. But uh, it, it, it's interesting to see if people pay something, they do it because they're watching it live. So mm -hmm. because it's it's about that experience, some it together with other people. This is the terrible thing that's missing so much right now. I was very lucky to to play live for audiences during the summer, and I remember like the first two three times I played for an audience last year, the audience was always uh, standing up in the end of the sh at the end of the show, t tearing up. This is not like in America. In the states, people stand up all the time because it's it's part of their tradition mm -hmm. to react like that for, for a crowd for for a concert but here it's it's the people are more reserved and they usually don't stand up in the end so easily but you could you could feel that they were like uh dried out sponges sucking up all the the music and, and it, they were really touched and so were we on stage so uh i'm really looking forward to the next time i can play for an audience because this time it's been much longer than than last year. Mm -hmm. I, I've had the good fortune to see you live twice here. In, well, actually, three times. Uh, twice with Monoziel. Uh My wife and I drove eight hours uh, one way to see you guys in uh, uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Ah, Alabama! It's when uh, you were doing uh, Yes, Yes, Yes. I think it was the beginning of that tour. Okay. And then uh, I saw the end of that tour in Pennsylvania, Bucknell University. I, I, I don't okay. know if you remember that, but uh, almost the, a lot of the same music. And then, of course, the third time I saw you was when you and I met in person at the ITG conference. Yeah, that's uh, like four years ago, I think. Yeah, 20, 2017. Yes. Uh, which was very nice to see you in a solo uh, mm -hmm. situation. And yeah, that was a fun. It was a fun show. Well, I remember you coming out at at that uh, that concert, and I think you played the first piece, and then you had this like pretend checklist. Okay, it's like okay, I know I have to play a double high C 
I have to do this, right? Because you're playing for a bunch of trumpet players, right? They were expecting you to do a certain yeah, thing. I think I, I did, I fooled around in the beginning and I played like one double high C. I mean, I can't really play double high Cs. I'm just screeching <laughs> around and I hit one. And then I said in the first announcement, this, this, by the way, this was for all the trumpet players here, for all the geeks. Right. And now, and now we're starting the show. It was, yeah. it was fun. Well, that was, it was terrific. And I remember the jazz trio that you had come out to play with you. And then of course, Trent Austin came and joined you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what a, what a, what a great player. What a great person oh, he, he is. He's, he's a, he's a monster musician. And uh, I know him of course, through these uh, conferences, cause I've been there now three or four times. Yeah. I don't really remember, but he's, he plays every night and he does all the sessions. Mm -hmm. And he has to deal with all the players. <laughs> I mean, I remember, I remember one. But uh, who I really admire are the the, the trios, you know, the, the rhythm sections, mm -hmm. because they have to play with with trumpet players for one week every night, and all of them want to play high and fast. This is unbelievable. <laughs> and I remember uh, at uh, a jam session in Banff in two thousand and eight. Mm -hmm. I came to, after our show, after the Nautilus show, I went to the basement and the jazz trio was playing and there were like a, a line of trumpet players playing on Cherokee. And it was like, <laughs> everybody went completely berserk as fast as possible. So I waited till I was, uh, it was uh, my time to jump in. And I went to the rhythm section. I said, let's take it four times slower. I, I went to everybody. And we did like the halftime of the halftime of the halftime. <laughs> and all of a sudden, everybody was like, oh, yeah. So <laughs> it was fantastic. Uh, maybe the theme of a new ITG would be uh, a week dedicated just to Chet Baker, right? Oh, Where everything yeah. is nice and a little more everybody, mellow. Everybody has to play without teeth. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we can <laughs> skip that part. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, but being able to see you perform live is great. And, of course, you see the energy. Um, I get it. You know, when you're performing and you see the, the audience, you can feel that, right? You're talking about the, your performance just this last summer and the way uh, the energy, the vibe gets going. And, but I, I'm interested in what you said about the way American audiences react versus European audiences, because in my mind, it's it's like the the Europeans are so rich in history with this. It seems like th that should be the natural reaction is you appreciate it so much more. It's in your DNA, uh, you know that that much further back. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's different in every country here. So every the uh, there are different grades of enthusiasm and but there are also different grades of arrogance so here in the german speaking countries there's basically people are more arrogant i think because because we have the big rich history we have oh. Mo mozart and haydn and bach and and uh, wagner and bruckner and brahms and they're all from here and so we are uh, kind of nose in the air and and Oh, what are they playing? Those brass players. Uh, I don't know. And uh, very reserved sometimes. Uh, <laughs> and in the States, I feel the crowd is much more welcoming. But, but on the other hand, if I get the audience here to stand up in the end, I know I did really great work. In the States, people stand up in the beginning when you go in, you know, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they're, they're like already enthusiast, uh, mm -hmm. enthusiastic. And yeah, I, I, I like both. Uh, the only thing I don't like is when people don't care. When when people sit in a concert and like in classical, this is what I didn't like in classical music because uh, you you work really hard to be able to play the whatever part you're playing in a symphony or whatever, and then you do it and you you have a great day and you make a great performance, and in the end people are like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and this this is something I didn't I didn't like in in the classical uh, world. Did you ever see the movie uh, Amadeus? As maybe. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. what I loved about that, whether it's historically accurate or not, is but during one of the operas, like the the audience is singing along. Mm -hmm. It's not just reserved for the people on stage, right? But it was like 
a real community city town event people showed yeah, up the, and they were they were you, drawn in the magic the magic flute yeah, right? when, yeah. when you spring for the people and not for the aristocrats and you know and to think uh applauding any time that they appreciated what they heard not just at the end of the last movement right yeah i and, wish it was like that i don't know if it was like that but mm -hmm. i'm sure it, it was a much more of a uh thing of the people it used to be because because i i know even in back in the in the days of johann strauss they had many big wooden halls for like thousands of people where people would go and and celebrate the the, the the music of the day which was of course strauss who was a big fan of richard richard wagner and he used to bring this music to the people and it was celebrated, but all those uh, wooden halls, they like at one point burned down. Mm. And, and uh, as, uh, as soon as like radio came around, I think that tradition was uh, on, a, on a descent. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I remember uh, being in Germany. I, I lived there from 70 to 74. Okay, uh, where? My, my dad was in the, in the Air Force, but we were stationed near Stuttgart. Okay. And my first musical experience was uh, Hansel and Gretel mm -hmm. Inc. in uh, mm -hmm. Berlin Opera House, I think in 72, 73. Very nice. Um, but that's, that's there, even all these, mm -hmm. these many years ago. But I, what I remember is the grandeur of the hall. The, it, it's, uh, and, and I don't know if bohemian is the right word for that, you know, but mm -hmm. it's just, uh, I remember taking Volks marches going through the Black Forest, going to Ludwigsburg. I don't know if... if I know Ludwigsburg very well. Uh, the castle and the and the grounds behind it yeah. with the... the oh, it's, it's do, you know the, do you know the movie Barry Lyndon? No. By Stanley Kubrick? No. A fantastic movie, but the, 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 the castle of Ludwigsburg is in that movie. Mm -hmm. it, has, it has a little role. However. <laughs> but, well, but what I'm... Anyway. What I'm at, well, you know... But there's something about Germany. I want to go back. I, I worked on a cruise ship, and so we were in Kiel in the in the off the Baltic, and in Hamburg. But every time I stepped foot into Germany, I felt felt kind of like I was home. You know, there's ah, there's something that draws me there. So, uh, you know, the the culture, the music, whatever it is, I, I hope to get back there uh, someday, and not by myself. I'd love to be able to take my family. And, mm. uh, and experience that, that. Germany is a fantastic uh, country. Very rich, uh, rich, rich history. Also, the, the, the most ugly history, but mm -hmm. it's a, a beautiful country. You have all kinds of uh, nature looks, uh, all different kinds uh, mm -hmm. of of nature, and and all those great halls and great orchestras everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I hope I hope it will stay that way. But I'm I'm doubting that. Yeah. We'll see how, how the pandemic goes. Yeah. Uh, were you born and raised in Austria? Yes. And that's where you're, you're living right now? Uh, yeah, I've, I've always lived in Austria, actually. I, I'm only f one time I, I thought about moving to Berlin. And the other time I thought about moving to New York. Both times were because of uh, breaking ups with <laughs> ex girlfriends or ex <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm I'm pretty happy I stay. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well, and you're teaching now at. Uh, tell me about this. It's called the Jam Lab. Yes, yes, I'm teaching at the Jam Lab, but I just started like two years ago, and I don't have many students. I had like four students, and one is finished, and one doesn't uh, play at the moment. And at the moment, teaching is, is no fun, of course. So <laughs> I, have one, I have one guy from England. I actually taught him two days ago, mm -hmm. eye to eye, which is great. Mm -hmm. I have to be in the same room with a brass instrument. I have to right. hear the sound. I have to work with the guy. I cannot, you, can, you can't play me stuff on Zoom. That's neat, but uh, not much more. Mm -hmm. And I have a guy in Sweden who I'm just Zooming with or Skyping with. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to give him hints what to what to listen to, what to transcribe. But the, the guy from England is it's, it's funny because he's he he lives in his little flat here, which is in the same house as the university. Mm -hmm. 
he went home, then he had to go into quarantine for two weeks, then he was with his folks, then he came back, had to go to, into quarantine for two weeks. It is, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm happy that we actually could meet and, and play. Well, yeah, I, you know, I teach as well, and I, I started going back in person this past week uh, yeah. to the university to teach because, uh, yeah, it just this just doesn't work. This is okay no. for interviews, but not for, yeah. <laughs> not for that. No, um, it, it might be okay if you play the keyboard or or a guitar. I don't know, but but for a, a wind instrument, you have to fill up the room with sound, and you have to be there. This this is. No way, but people, I think students, as a, first of all, I really like uh, teaching because I learn a lot for myself as well. <laughs> I, I did not expect that to be that interesting. Um, well, but yeah, was that the first time you had taught? Uh, certainly you, you've had students no, before I, this. No, not really. I, I only, I only, I, I, I always thought of teaching as something I might never do because I, I, when I was a student, I, I helped out some other uh, students and took their teaching job for like a, a, as a substitute for like 10 days, two weeks. And then I had to teach all those kids on the countryside who had to go to the music school, uh, no matter if they wanted or not. Their, their parents decided they had to go. So that was a, a very depressing, terrible kind of work, which I never wanted to come back to. <laughs> But actually working with people who want to do something is much more interesting. So uh, I kind of enjoy it. And I had I had a student from China who just finished last year and he he went back and he already has a job there. And I'm very I'm very proud of that one because uh, I, I didn't make a, a, a great player out of him, but I got him to play out of his uh, guts. You know, I made him. I made him play what he what he feels in the moment, and and he he really made that step. That was very uh, moving to see that he could do that. You know, uh, one of the comments here uh, is from a friend of mine, colleague, and, and a former student, David Wolf, who you actually met at the the Hershey ITG. Oh, but hi, he David. says he says, "What tunes or artists would you recommend for starting transcribing?" And I guess this goes along with you know when a student comes to you. Right. What is this? Where you start is to have them immediately start doing this. Uh, now, now it is what we do because I, I mean it depends on what the students want to learn, what they want to do. Yeah? If if a, a guy wants to just play the trumpet better and is not interested in playing jazz, I don't let him transcribe solos so much. Uh, but however, if a, a guy is interested in playing jazz, it's always like pick. Uh, pick the ones that are easy to follow more or less like uh, Clifford Brown or Clark Terry or, or Jet Baker, something that is clear. Uh, and yeah. And, and then just go with, with whatever you find. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but do it. That's, it's very important to, to, to look beyond. Is this something you had done as you were growing up? Did you start transcribing at some point? Uh, just a little, but the, 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 I did a, a few transcriptions, but those helped me a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a great experience. Uh, but I have, I have a, there's one solo by Clark Terry I, I recommend to everybody. It's, it's long and it's a lot of notes, but they're all very, very deep. So, uh, and he's just one of the greatest mm -hmm. of all time, one of the greatest players, and it swings unbelievably hard and uh, it's fun to listen to and and it's just unbelievable actually I, actually I, I want them uh, the, the solo is so epic that I want people to know about it and I want them to hear it so I have them I have them work on it you know I hear when you play jazz solos I hear those influences I hear you change your sound I hear you more of a Clark Terry and then there are times where I hear you more uh, um, like who would be a great, you know, may, maybe not Arturo, maybe not quite that bright and, and fast, but uh, these are people you certainly listen to. Uh, Clifford Brown, you mentioned, 
uh, everything I listened to is like in there. It, it, it went through there and it left something. Mm -hmm. And um, you know what? Myself, I'm like a sponge. I soak up stuff and I keep what I like and I forget what I don't like. And I try mm -hmm. to put everything into my into my frame. Mm -hmm. Some and when whenever I like something, when I when I think of something as the ideal sound, then I come back when I'm playing and I want to sound like that. Yeah? When I go in a, in some direction, I mean, let's be honest, if you go up, you want to sound like Maynard, you know, that's the thing. Well, then, it, it, this, is, this is one of the hardest things I think to get a student to understand is that they have to listen. And, oh, and you know, if, oh, if they're waiting until they're 18 or 19 years old, you know, and they get to university and that's when they start to listen. It's, it's not that it's too late, mm -hmm. but they're really far behind, right? But you know, and and I remember growing up listening to uh, Hank Williams Jr. and Marty Robbins. These are country, and you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, my parents had the Boston Pops, uh, so I was getting all kinds of uh, mm -hmm. Neil Diamond, Neil Sedak. I mean, you know, a, a wide range of oh of yeah, things. very but, important. Listen, 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 listen. Go to concerts, go to concerts, and listen again, and play. Play with other guys, form a band, meet regularly, and play and listen and go back, eat, sleep, practice, play, listen again. You know that's it's. You know I started uh, pulling the the uh, cassette tapes out of my brother's car with like, and there was like on one side there was uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears Life with a tuba solo. And on the other side, there was like an El Jaro uh, album. And on the next cassette, there was like Chuck Mangione, like Life at the Hollywood Bowl. And, and I listened those cassettes till they were dead, you know? <laughs> and uh, our generation, we still know about cassettes. Yeah, what, yeah. What, what happened to cassettes was incredible. <laughs> How many times I tried to stick them back together and, and right. still listen. And then it changed to CDs and, and I had thousands of CDs and now everything is in little machines but nobody listens so much anymore so but I'm happy my, my son who turns 15 like in a week he, he's into music so much he's listening to everything mm -hmm. but of course in his generation he's, he's now into Jacob Collier and, and stuff like that which is fine but uh, he's, he's, he's getting all the, the old important stuff too well, you know, even the variety in like a nozzle show, I'm remembering back, you did a Shostakovich string quartet uh, mm -hmm. piece. And then, uh, uh, oh, girls, uh, some pop tune, I can't remember. Bum, 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 ba -dum, bum, 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 ba -dum, bum, bum, ah, That's actually a German tune. It was just a, a Harold Faltermeyer who, who wrote the score for a Beverly Hills Cup. That was oh, Beverly, yeah. X Left. Yeah. left but yeah. you know but to have those in the same show it's like you you there's so much variety it's not like you just come out and play classical you just come out and play swing or right yeah, it's, in, it, in, in not till it was always the same everybody in the band brings something he's really into and uh, brings it to the band and we play it and the main the main three composers of course it's like uh leonard that's the lonely boy guy uh gerhard is another trombone player and myself we we bring all our influences in. And so we have a great variety of, of music. Because Leonard, for example, he's he studied jazz trombone, but he but he specialized into like old music. He played a lot of Baroque trombone with with Nicolas Hanoncourt in his uh, old music ensemble, stuff like that. I played most jazz and and folk, like umpa music. Uh, and uh, but I'm interested in pretty everything. Uh, but I brought more the jazz stuff to the band. And Gerhard, for example, he's a, he has a big crush on Russian music. He's he's the Shostakovich guy. Uh, yeah. So, and we always exp we always find new stuff. Like for the for the new show that actually never premiered because right. the pandemic came in between. Uh, we we had a, a tune uh, by Lutoslavsky. Like Lutoslavsky wrote uh, variations uh, or, over the, the the Paganini variations. He did he yeah. did a, a arrangement of that, which is crazy. But we recorded it like uh, two months ago or something, and might be might come out in one or other the other form. I don't know. 
but it's always what I wanted to say is that music is always something, some new streams coming, always something new joins the, the bandwagon. And so we're getting wider and wider in, in the. In well, the, but, but not just yeah. the music, but the theatrics that go along with it. I mean, uh, and the makeup, right? I mean, this, oh, yeah. especially this past, uh, this past show that you had done, that was. was yeah, that was really involved uh, with the full makeup and the and the costuming. Uh, did you consider that? I, I thought it was successful. Did you guys consider that a success? Uh, everything is a success at, at the time, and everything is a failure at another time. I, um, I think we had we had we had a peak um, when we did magic moments and then blow felt these two shows are like the peak uh in our um, history in the band history because we then we really hit everything full and then we we just played sold out shows everywhere and we had like a real good run and then it it normalized a little i would say and since then um i think every show was great some some shows greater, some some shows less. We we did a show about Richard Wagner, which was we we only played it like thirty times or something. We'd never played anything uh, uh, so 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 uh, so little. Uh, uh, thirty times. I think there are a lot of groups that would love to be able to play at least to the yeah, thirty. Yeah, but we but we had shows we played right. it five five hundred times. So. Right. Uh, uh, it was not successful, but it was a very, very interesting experience, and it was a great show. It just was not for everybody because it was really out there. So <laughs> um, everything is. We, we, I always love whatever we are doing at the moment very much. And at one point, when we used to make DVDs, it was always the tipping point. We did the DVD recording, and then it declined and it wasn't that interesting anymore and then it started to uh play it again uh we should work on something new um yeah ups and downs i have to get my i have to get my cable otherwise oh, okay my, my battery is going to be but i'm, I'm staying okay. with you i'm just uh, taking you on a walk well that's okay uh we can get the grand tour so uh, I'm thinking back. You mentioned uh, getting the the cassette tapes out of your brother's car. You're, you're referring to Hans. Yes, of course. Um, he's he's not a bad trumpet player himself, is he? No, he's, uh, <laughs> I've heard worse. <laughs> I think uh, one of the most enjoyable uh, uh, things to watch was when the two of you. I I don't know if that was the very first Gonch at home you no, had no, done. No, 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 no. But was that, number eight. What a treat. And even if, if there hadn't been captions, uh, just to watch the two of you go back and forth and then uh, in conversation, but then to play. Mm. And it's just, uh, that was remarkable. So you know, I really appreciate you guys sharing that. But um, what's it like growing up with uh, a trumpet player like that? He's older than you, yes? Yeah, he's uh, 23 years older than me. So. so uh, was he around then while while you were was he a big influence on you as a musician oh he he was and always will be my biggest influence of course because uh he was already uh having the job in the vienna philharmonic when i was six or seven so uh, and before that he was in two other orchestras so and when he came by, he practiced a little, and I always heard that ideal sound since since I was a baby. So this is the this is the my my road was laid out right there, and everybody told me I'm going to make the same. So of course I had to fail and find my own ways. But oh, uh, well, that's, I, actually, interesting. I'm, that's interesting hmm? you say that. How did how did you fail? What, because I'm no, every, everybody expected of me to become like him, the, the next uh, Vienna Philharmonic trumpet player, and uh, oh. and of course, then I came, uh, being 23 years younger, I, I came to Vienna with when I was 15, and he was like uh, on the peak uh, of his playing. He was just becoming, he was just reaching the peak of his playing, and. 
and everybody called me the little brother of Gunj. I was there was no Thomas Gunj. It was always the little brother of Gunj, and of course this was uh, uh, like a planned out uh, plot to make me uh, destroy everything, all, all the hopes of everybody around. And that's, that of course happened. And uh, but for me that was that was uh, great. It was the best thing that happened to me. That was my failure because I had to pick myself up and find. Uh, my own road, my own path, and as soon as I left classical music, as a, the, first of all, I studied three years with the first teacher, and uh, until a, a point where I couldn't play the trumpet anymore, everything was destroyed. So I, I really had physical problems with it, uh, and then I studied three years with another teacher, where I picked myself out of this mess, uh, and I learned how to play, how to deal, how to practice. Mm -hmm. And at the end of this road in the classical realm, there was a, an audition and I went to this audition and at that audition, I didn't win anything, but I, I made it into the second round and I knew for myself, okay, I know how this works. I know how I have to live and uh, I know what I have to do to make this possible. And I was 21 at the time and I said, and now I'm going to try out what I, what I'm really interested in. And then I went to jam sessions, stuff like that. And in, immediately, I, I never wanted to go back. I, I became Thomas Gunch within a few months. Everybody, it, it was another world and I was, I was happy. And uh, from then on, everything was better. But of course, I'm, I, I'm, I'm somebody I'm interested in every kind of music and I regret not being able to sit in an orchestra from time to time because I just love the experience and the sound and I really would love to sit down in a in the opera and, and play from time to time just like a, a third trumpet on, on, on anything because I love music you know but uh, you can't have everything it's fine. Well, the, yeah, so two different roads, of course, but two different voices, right? Hans has got that classical orchestral approach. You've got now, uh, well, it, here's, here's what I'm getting at, is you, we all blow through the little end, right? And the sound comes out the, the big end of the trumpet. Mm -hmm. But really, the, the difference is here, right? I mean, you're still playing the trumpet uh, uh, technically the right way, right? But it's, you just had to find your own voice to get through to put through uh, that trumpet. Yes, it most I, I would say that once you you mastered the the basics and once of course uh one thing is clear you have to know your shit. You have to you have to practice really hard for for a certain amount of time to get it out of your brain into your fingers and to to get everything moving without thinking about it. If you have to think about everything, you won't be able to uh, tell many stories, you know. But once you master that, it's uh, most of it is in the head. I, I, I like the variety of, of situations with yourself. And you play with big bands. You play, of course, with, uh, with Nozeal. Uh, you do solos. Uh, I think you, Leonard, and uh, Willie have a trio. No, that... it's, it's Albert. Al Albert Vida. He he subbed. He subbed for Willie on the Yes 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 tour on the second one because right. Willie took took a uh, uh, took a bachelorette or how do you call it a, a bachelor year uh, yeah. where he, he didn't play. So we had him as a sub, and in the end of every show, we we played a trio encore, so the others could go out and have a drink. And we would play a different tune on every tour. So after the one and a half years that Albert was with us, we had like enough tunes for for at least half a good show. So we decided to stay together. And uh, yeah, it's the trio is great fun because it is it is really uh, fantastic chamber music. I, I like I see it as a chamber music trio which can go in really every direction, but it's not nozzle style. We, we don't do shows. We sit down and we play whatever, whatever, whatever we want to play, but the variety of music is very interesting. What's it like working with uh, Leonard? You've, you've known him for a very long time. Is, is oh, it just, yeah. is the relationship kind of like, uh, 
brothers or I don't want to say husband and wife, you know, but I mean, it's, it's, you know, yeah, each other. It is, it, right? is, it is a family thing. It is like a yeah. marriage, a long marriage, but the, the whole Nautil is a long marriage, but Leonard is special because we, oh. we had all kinds of ups and downs. Uh, actually, uh, I did, we didn't talk to each other for one or two years, uh, like 20, more than 20 years ago, we had like, I, I was, I, I wasn't a very nice person then. And, and he, uh, he's much nicer today as well. So, however, we had, we had all kinds of ups and downs and it is a very, very deep uh, and long friendship. And I'm, he's somebody you can just count on. This is, and he, he's a, he's, he's very, his knowledge is amazing. He's, he's always willing to learn, and whenever I don't know anything, I ask him because that's a challenge for him. <laughs> and sometimes if he doesn't know something, it makes me laugh inside because, <laughs> just because he's like always he has to know everything, he has to understand everything. And he's, he's pretty much self-taught, but he, he's a man of very good taste. Um, he just likes to be sometimes he, he likes to have it hard he, he he's like very catholic in his mm. uh, in, the, in the way he he works he's he, sometimes you really have to beat he has to beat himself up uh and work really hard he's always working 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 and whenever we were on tour he, he was always he was never relaxing he was always sitting at the computer composing arranging or uh, yeah always uh, Wilfried is the same, by the way. He's, he's, he's not he's, he's not composing all the time, but he's also a, a workaholic like that. So whenever we're on a train ride for like seven hours, you all the time you hear the computers going, and they're always into work. And and I'm just trying to get sober from the last night or something. You know how. How can you live like that? I don't understand it. I want to be alone. I want to be in my room. I want to just sleep. And as soon as we arrive at the place, they are going to out to see the cities, the, the historic city center. They're going to see the churches and and the abbeys and whatever. So I'm actually I'm very lazy. I'm I'm just a very busy, lazy person. That's that's what I am. Uh, I, 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 I take I I'm the one who takes the, the playing the most serious. I'm 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 really I think I'm I'm the I'm the guy who practices the most in the band. Yeah, that's interesting you say that because you know to to have you and Robert next to each other, you are so outgoing and Robert is so stoic. Ah, he's not that but, stoic. But I think just his English is not that well. That's but all. when he plays, it's like there's no doubt. I mean, all of it. I mean, top to bottom, every one of you are absolutely phenomenal musicians. It's just, but that personality, right? And I thought when mm. I talked to him, I, I asked, is this who you are in, in real life? Or is this the kind of person you play on stage? He goes, no, that's me. You know, that's, mm. which I find that fascinating. Right. Um, pretty much all of us are like um, as we are on stage. That's I think that authenticity is is a very very important thing in music or comedy or any any actually in any profession. Mm -hmm. I think as long as you're telling the truth, it's fine because mm -hmm. otherwise you don't have much to say, you know. Mm -hmm. And everybody recognizes if if you just learn something, so you have to put some feelings into it and for that the best is to be just honest and uh, Robert I'm, I only practice that much that I can't compete with him because if he if he would do the amount of practicing that I have done over the last 20 years he, he would be unstoppable all the time he's just too lazy that's well, my, that's my I asked that's him luck for me I said if you he said you know I haven't played this is this was a few months ago I said, you haven't played. How long would it take you to get back in shape to do a show? He, oh, three or four days. And, you know, it's... Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe more. Maybe a little bit more. No, uh, uh, it, 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 I don't believe him. Yeah. I think he takes, he, he, ta he takes more than three or four days now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but 
I know when when every year we used to meet again in fall after a long break. We always used to have like a six week summer break or eight weeks because we did a really a lot of playing. We did a lot of shows and. Uh, it was always that, you know, the, you play the most from April to July and then the last few weeks it's really bad and you, ah, oh, shit, again, oh, I, don't, I can't take it anymore, all the traveling and all the, and do the show again and I can't see the guys anymore, ah, and then you come back after, after a long break and actually you always think, man, this is the greatest job on earth, so, uh, but when you come back, the first show is always great because everybody's relaxed. And from the second show, you can see who did how much preparation. <laughs> <laughs> because when you try to run a marathon without doing the training before, uh, you are you are fucked the second time around. Right. So. right. Have you run a marathon? No. Uh, uh, you know what? Uh, how about we plan that uh, on the other side of the pandemic? Uh, I'll come it over is, there uh, and we'll is, run. A marathon is quite scary. I would, uh, the, the, I did a lot of jogging, and I just restarted two months ago, and it was really, really, really hard because I did. That was a long time. I did no, no running at all. But um, I'm now back to run like uh, ten kilometers, sometimes twelve, thirteen. So I'm, I'm in a, in a longer distance now, which is like. Okay, I'm maybe I'll make ten miles soon, but more than that is really hard. And back when I was really in good shape and I had like a, a, I'm sure I had like sixty pounds less or something. But then I, I the the longest I ever ran was like maybe twenty miles. Wow! But well, uh, a marathon was still out of out of sight. I, I did a marathon uh, eleven years ago. Oh, and wow. uh, and I've I've got somebody challenging me to do another one at the end of this year. We'll see, we'll see mm -hmm. how that goes. But uh, I just challenge myself not to be so fat anymore. Anyway. No. <laughs> hey, I can do it. Anybody can do it. You know. Mm -hmm. So um, now I just need to challenge myself to practice as much as you do. I think that would that would be good. Yeah, if if practicing the trumpet would make me lose weight, I'll be skinny, man. I'll be one skinny guy. Um, well, look at Alan Vizzuti, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, your wife a musician? No, she's an actress, but she, her she plays the uh, violin and the viola because her father was a great uh, Viennese music uh, violin player. And she has an ear and a heart for the music, but her main thing is is acting. Did you and meet? Actually, actually, her main thing is 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 uh, kids stuff because we just have too many. <laughs> did you meet uh, at a gig, or did you go to actually, see something she was performing in? Uh, no, uh, actually, we've known each other for a pretty long time just by being at the same places. And she used to be at the Nautil. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was 16 and she was 15, something like that. So uh, we've known each other for, for a while, but uh, I, I never, I, it never came to my thoughts that we would make a pair that just happened like 12 years ago. And yeah, yeah. there you go. Well, my wife is a violinist as well. I think there's something about trumpet and violin that uh, naturally attract. <laughs> I, no, I think... Uh, uh, girls are naturally attracted to trumpets. That's, that's uh, <laughs> um, oh, that just popped into my head. Of course, uh, I know Mark Gould is a, a friend of, friend of yours. Uh, I just got his his book, uh, Orchestra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. It's it's a fun read. Uh, I guess. But I guess so. Ha have you seen it? Or read uh, it? It's just parts of it. He never yeah, sent okay. me a copy because he's so cheap. He should really <laughs> send me. Mark, if you're seeing this, send me a copy of your book, please. I'll I'll accept a digital copy. I can I can read it on my phone <laughs> in German or uh, or English. No, no, uh, only, only in English or Yiddish. Maybe maybe <laughs> we can meet halfway. So you've got you've got colleagues all over the world. Do you get invited? I know you get invited to play in different places. Do you get invited to teach? Uh, do master classes anywhere? 
uh, it goes hand in hand uh, most of the time. I, but I never was invited just to teach. It was always like I was invited to play and do a master class, mm -hmm. or do a master class and play. So exactly. it's always a double feature. Uh, the only real job I had, uh, I was I was invited four years ago. But that was when I hung out with Carol Don Reinhardt. I was invited to sit as a member of the jury at the trumpet competition. That was the only time I didn't really have to play. And mm -hmm. that was actually fun because we spent nine days in Rome and I had to work only every second day. And the rest of the time we just went out and looked at the greatest city, you know. Mm -hmm. So please, if, if there's a competition in Rome again, please invite me. Well, you know, I had uh, been talking to your management. Uh, was it Vienna Arts Management? Oh, I think. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, trying to get uh, Nozel over here, but he was saying um, uh, he was trying to get the trio. So, yeah, but but Nozel, Nozel has a different management. Uh, well, um, when things uh, get back to normal or whatever new normal is, uh, one of the things I want to do is whatever it takes to get you over here uh i yeah. would love to have you as a guest oh yeah oh yeah we'll do that but uh even nozil has, has we worked in the states with opus three and they they are i think they are not they don't exist anymore as a result mm -hmm. of the pandemic so mm -hmm. they were but somebody bought them and but i i have no no eyes into the future no idea uh I don't know how is, how things will go for traveling anyway. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Uh, at, at least there's there's going to be another year until we can travel as like we used to. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at the comments here, uh, Ed Rowell uh, asking, "What does nozzle mean?" And uh, just quickly, uh, nozzle means uh, the fruitful but like in, in like if you have many kids like like that how do you call that what's the verb uh, uh i don't know uh <laughs> I, I i'm i'm not the person to ask for that if you've got too many i think uh <laughs> in, in debt is the word you're in debt. no 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 not like that it's just uh just uh fruitful uh, okay say, but of course he was the he was the owner of the pub that was really which is how the the group got its name yes no because we always played at the pub and people would ask us out of of the pub to play somewhere else and when we arrived there they would ask uh what's your name by the way so i said at the first gig outside of the pub i said uh nozzle brass yeah that's it that's how the name came along. And uh, Brent, Brenda Clark uh, just chimed in. She says prolific. Is that the word you were looking for? Prolific? Maybe. I have to, I have uh, to, I have uh, to give it a watch. Uh, so all, now all kinds of comments are coming in. By the way, okay. Phil Snedeker. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the right one in just a second. By the way, um, Phil Snedeker is on. Uh, do you know Phil? I don't know. Uh, he a uh, trumpet player at uh, Hart School and uh, leads the Washington Brass. Oh, uh, hello, Phil. However, yeah. uh, however, my Google Translator says fruitful. Uh, so, well, perfect. There, we all learned something well, today. I got the right word. Yeah, that, but I don't think that's how you should market yourselves over here. Yeah, I would. I would say <laughs> I would keep it Minoza. Pro, you said prolific. Okay, what's yeah. prolific? Ah, no, 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 it's not prolific. Well, maybe take, take fruitful. It's fine. Fruitful. Let's go with fruitful. fruitful. <laughs> um, well, it, I know you're, you're staying busy. You're doing the gotcha at home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Hello, Karen. Thank you. Fruitful is, fruitful true. is true. Thank you, Karen. Hi, Karen. I hope you're fine. I hope you had a great birthday celebration. And you this got somebody you know. Oh, yes. I know Karen. Karen uh, is a girl or a lady who follows us to every single gig we did in the States. And not only in the States, but also in Europe. She, she always came over. She saved all her money to go to Europe. And she went to every single show that was going on everywhere. So 
she is by far the the most uh, passionate fan out there. <laughs> Hello, Karen. That's fantastic. Uh, not quite a groupie, though, right? I mean, she you wouldn't classify her as a. Uh, she she. <laughs> she could be a groupie, but it's the yeah. age demographic is is a. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. We we came around a little too late, probably, to be in the hot groupie phase. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> so tell me, how long's the beard gonna stay? Yeah, well, my my plan is to let it let it grow, let it grow, uh, uh, as long as this shit show is going down because <laughs> my theory was i will i will keep it growing until people can fill up a hole again and they don't have to wear masks mm. so i think three times that so i i had a chart uh, i did it for one of my shows i did a chart where there was karl marx and charles darwin johannes brahms <laughs> and like bearded, bearded people, and they're trying which which one am I going to reach soon? And I mean, Marx, I had him pretty fast, and now I'm going for. Uh, I mean, the the real goal is to reach Albus Dumbledore for my kids. They would really appreciate that. My wife, not so much. Well, I think there was a. So, uh, you were teasing yesterday. There was a picture of you. It looked like you were getting ready to get it uh, to get it trimmed. I thought it was going to come off. I thought I was going to see a clean shaven. No, we have a new. We have there's a new law in in place tomorrow here where you have to. You're only allowed to wear a certain kind of uh, uh, mask type, but you have to wear it everywhere. So these masks are not allowed anymore. Hmm. So you have to wear something called an FFP2 mask, which is the most safe mask to protect others, and. Uh, but if you have, there was like a, a scientist on television explaining that if you wear a beard, the mask does not work properly. So yeah. they invited me uh, uh, for a TV thing where I would discuss it with a scientist. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't shave in my beard. They <laughs> took they took everything from me. They won't get my beard. Good. Uh, are, are people taking it uh, more seriously seriously there than? Well, I don't know what your perspective is on the states and how we're taking it here, but I don't think we're as serious. Uh, I don't know. You, you're so serious. You went to the capital. <laughs> no, uh, so, uh, I, I didn't. I know, I know, I know. But the guy with the, the Jamiroquai guy was wow. fantastic. We we saw we we it that was pretty scary. Yeah. However, I don't know what what scares. The only thing that scares me actually is how. You know, you, you always had uh, crazy people uh, commenting on social media. You always had that through every, every election, whatever, every process. You got like crazies or, or people who get very angry and have issues. But they always could go out and go to a bar or to a show or talk to people, hang out, touch people, get a hug. Uh, and now they're all sitting at home getting crazy shouting at their laptops and this this makes me really as I'm, I'm I don't have the best feelings at the moment mm -hmm. because um, and it's it seems that many things are, it's 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 not allowed to talk about certain things anymore you're not allowed to to think about things uh, it's it's a really a tough time I because yeah, I was, I was, I was like defriended de and and blocked by people I really look up to for like nothing, and just because the atmosphere is so heated up with with fear and it's it's hard to explain because of course I I don't want to get this disease I don't want to give it to anybody but on the other hand we have to deal with it somehow so you have to talk about it but some people consider talking about it. They, they, you talk about something and they call you a Nazi, for example. This is crazy what, what social media is doing. So, uh, But on the other hand, you have people, and also on, on Facebook, I know some trumpet players on Facebook, which I won't mention names, but 
all all they do is all day posting like political stuff all the time and there are no there is no room for facts anymore and for thought it's it's just and what what bugs me the most is because I, I love music and I love humor. I love to have a good joke and, and a good laugh. And now you have to you have to write you have you have to put an emoji in to make people know that this was ironic. <laughs> and this is this is I'm sorry to say, but this is fucked up. Really. And and I'm and people are losing it completely because they don't meet and don't talk to each other. They just read what other people write and they feel what they want to feel about it. They don't ask themselves how this was meant. They don't hear a, a, a melody of, of speech. They don't see gestures. They don't look into eyes and they don't have to confront themselves with somebody. So they 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 do the craziest shit there's actually there's one video which i really like it describes social media so great you see two uh bunches uh, two uh, there's a bunch of dogs on one side and a bunch of dogs on the other side of like an automatic uh fence mm -hmm. and they're barking at each other really really hard and then the lamp goes off and the fence is opening and as soon as the fence is opening the dogs turn around and run away in different directions <laughs> and this is social media somehow you know? yeah. yeah but the bark now all we can hear is the barking because the fence stays closed and we all have to sit at home and and go crazy and, and people don't earn money and they see their life running through their hands and and go away and other people are just uh alone and other people are in tiny flats with a lot of family and they start to go crazy that way and there's no compensation and instead of instead of helping each other out we talk about who is responsible for this pandemic and everybody points with the finger to the other group and people start calling the police saying there are there are six people in the park and they are not from the same household and they are not wearing their masks so it is completely crazy so I, I, I'm, I'm just improvising myself through this shit but i don't know where this is going well I, I think what is of course social media has been a blessing and a curse right i mean that's obvious mm -hmm. uh, there there are fun things to see like uh, even going back to lonely boy mm -hmm. right somebody photoshopped bernie sanders i don't know if you know was that I did. This did. Was <laughs> of course i did that. but see isn't that what you want to see when you open up Facebook? Of course. You know, is that that kind of levity, that kind of fun? You know, and I and and checking somebody's pictures of their kids or their pets or, you know, I mean, that's that's what I focus on on social media because it is so easy to get dragged into uh, mm. a depression or a foul mood. And yeah, I've even gotten very careful about how I word an email. I try to read it back to myself and think, you know, I hope, <laughs> I hope this doesn't come off. The whole the thing, the, the, the whole thing is, it's it's also. Uh, I consider myself to be left somehow, but on the other hand, I what goes on with uh, political correctness and stuff like that, I I cannot, I, I hate this shit mm -hmm. because I'm 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 more interested in what people do than in what they say. So I, I'd like to judge people because of their deeds. And if somebody uses a wrong word, now he's marked for life and he's branded and he's in a, in a corner. And this is wrong. This is wrong for my understanding. I think you always have the, you have to have the right to make mistakes and you have to talk, never stop talking to each other. Mm -hmm. But the, today we live in a kind of uh, a culture that makes you, they, they drive you out of the system. They just wait for one, for one thing. And w once you did that thing, there's no coming back from that. And this will not change easily, but, but it, 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 there has to be something done because the the amount of of racists and assholes did not decline at any point they just hide themselves better mm -hmm. because they learn how to swim through this area that's the problem we are we are we are shooting on into 
we are shooting people who didn't do really bad things and other people do the worst stuff and they're just they look nice and they say the right words and they wear suits and they're fine and they're making a lot of money while other people don't and ah so social media can be very bad but i still expect to to be able to have the full experience there i want to see jokes and good music and a good laugh but i also want to be able to talk to people and try to bring people to to together somehow well but, you know here here you are and and here i am talking and yeah. whether or not i agree with you this would be what what we should aim for is a civil conversation civil discourse now I, i'm not saying that you and i disagree or, or not on this I'm, i actually agree with you but what if i were somebody that was like i can't believe i invited this guy on here you know i'm gonna yeah, you know, then we then we would say that and i would say what i think about it but it would be fine because <laughs> it, it is you don't have to like what i say it, 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 it's not it's but it's this okay. is i think it's quite arrogant of the left to because they always look a little down to the right i think this is arrogant as well i think it is arrogant of very smart people how they look down on people who are who are not that smart um we have to sometimes just accept that things are not the same for everybody and try our best but um there should be room for everybody absolutely and, and not and not just a few who are smarter or richer or or faster we have to somehow make an environment that works for everybody well and and the beautiful thing is that music is one of those things that reaches everybody right you know and that i think is is what you know you and i have different places that we play but we both miss that we both miss that ability to connect with whatever audience is in front of us and i think that's where every artist out there is is clamoring right now to get back to that and every patron mm -hmm. is wanting to to come back and and enjoy all this i mean you talk about that audience uh from an ozeal and they were up with tears i mean yeah. everybody's everybody's hungry for that now so yes i i soon we we have to get back to this soon oh yeah very much and this is it is a very very important way of of having conversation with mm -hmm. each other because we can shout at each other on social media because we don't share the same political opinions but i can play a melody and catch and, and touch something in the heart of that person mm -hmm. who really disagrees with everything I say. I heard that I, I, I watched a clinic. There's a beautiful clinic of, uh, of Phil Smith somewhere on YouTube, like post his, his lip thing where he's just teaching. He's, he's doing a, 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 a long class and he says so many very true and interesting things. And everything he says is 100% authentic. I really dig him. Uh, and he says at, at one point he mentions uh, because somebody asked him for uh, who, who are the people he, he he loves musical and he mentions barbara streisand and he says you know i really i really disagree with everything she says politically i think she's a terrible person politically but when she sings mm -hmm. she touches something she strikes a chord and this is this is what we're talking about this is the power of of music and this is what what we can change we can change the world in very small portions and this is the portions we can do so whenever you play anything please make it mean something mm -hmm. never play only notes just tell something tell a story that's that's, that's my message for today girls well, and boys what a great message though and and not just platitudes i mean there's real truth there's real value uh to to that so thank you for yeah. saying that well thank you thank you yeah. I, I hope i hope yeah um so hang on just a second if let's see if there are any other comments here we need to address but um well okay so uh, let me just say thanks to the people that were tuned in today and i appreciate you joining us uh, of course this was the first installment of the live with series and our first guest my first guest uh the incredible thomas gotch uh trumpet player and uh apologist for politics uh <laughs> <laughs> um 
So I look forward to uh, not just seeing you on YouTube and other places, but I look forward to an opportunity for us to actually share a beer or, or a coffee oh. or something together. We uh, will have that. We will some. have that. And please say, please say hello to all my predecessors. So if every every uh, trumpet player who comes to your show, yeah, everybody you mentioned, please say my best regards to everybody. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> so okay, so hang on one one second. And uh, yeah. again, everybody, thank you very much. Uh, if you missed the first part of this, all of this is going to show up on the YouTube channel uh, either later tonight or by tomorrow morning. And uh, next uh, next month, what is it? February? Uh, Rex Richardson is going to be here February twenty third. So that'll be another fun evening with uh, with Rex. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. So bye bye. Thomas, Thomas, bye hang Karen. On.